All right, let's uh, do this so we start the weekend. Um, so we'll finish up for you series coefficients today, and then we'll look at uh, um, a theorem called Parsifal's theorem that allows us to calculate the power within a within a waveform from the Fourier series, series coefficients. And then we'll start actually Fourier transforms on Monday, which are actually a little easier to use. Calculation of Fourier series coefficients is, is never easy. There are some properties, you can use some symmetry properties that to help you. Um, for example, if X, X of T has even symmetry. Now, an example waveform that has even symmetry would be like the cosine function. Okay, any, so uh, anything, this is another example of a waveform that has even symmetry. Um, the definition would be that x of minus t is equal to x of t, uh, if that's true. The, the function has even symmetry. But in that case, then all the B and coefficients in the trigonometric representation are zero. So those are the coefficients of the sine function and the, all the sine functions have odd symmetry. Okay, so if X of T has even symmetry, it's just the sum of the cosine functions. Um, in the compact trigonometric, the CN, which was equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the AN and BN, is just equal to the AN, and all the phase angles are, are zero for all N. And in the exponential Fourier series, X of N is, is uh, equal to AN over two. They're all real valued for all n. None of the x, x of n's are actually complex numbers, like in the general case. Um, an, another, there's a similar set of rules for if the function has odd symmetry. Uh, that would be x of minus t is equal to the negative of x of t. So a function with odd symmetry would be one like this. Okay. If I tried to draw kind of a similar function, they could be similar. Notice there's just a time shift difference between those two functions. Um, um, but one has, so it depends on where you put the t equals zero point. Uh, one has even symmetry, the other has odd symmetry. But if the function has odd symmetry, all the cosine terms are zero in the trigonometric Fourier series, okay, because all the cosine functions have even symmetry. The, the cn are equal to just the bn in this case, because all the a n are zero. And the phase angles are all equal to 90 degrees. And that's for all values of that. So again, if you if you notice this symmetry, you can save yourself some work. You don't even have to, you know, if it has even symmetry, you only have to set up that, that interval for the bn coefficients. You know that they're all zero. And here, the xn coefficients in this case should turn out to be all imaginary. Again, they're not complex. They don't have real and imaginary parts, but they're all entirely imaginary or imaginary for all of them. 
Um, we can also have, we'll also have certain symmetries with regard to the line spectra if the function is real and we're only working with real periodic functions, okay. Our time domain functions could be complex, you know, have a, a real and imaginary part like cosine omega t plus j sine omega t, for example, e to the j omega zero t is a complex function. Okay, so, but we'll be calculating for you series only for x, x of t, real x of t. In that case, that x of n have conjugate symmetry. So these are the Fourier series coefficients in the, in the exponential case. And that means the X to the minus N values are the complex conjugates of the positive N values. So again, it can save you some work, some calculation. The other thing is the, the amplitude spectra will have even symmetry. Now we'll see this even with Fourier transforms where, where a spectrum actually becomes a continuous function of frequency instead of just discrete lines, but the amplitude spectrum will still have even symmetry. And the phase spectrum as odd symmetry. So I did a, a an example the other day that where I actually calculated The Fourier series of an output of a circuit, you know, given the Fourier series of the input signal and the frequency response. But I wanted to go through the, the details here. So, for example, I'm going to find the frequency response first, given a circuit. And we do that by circuit analysis. We're after the H of omega function. So you could use, you could, could uh, solve the, the phasor circuit with J omegas for the impedances. Alternatively, you can solve the S domain circuit for the transfer function and then substitute J omega in for S. And that's equivalent as long as the circuit is a causal circuit. The impulse response is causal. And then, they're, then they're actually equivalent. There's a slight difference in terminology. H of S function, we call the system transfer function. The H of omega, we call the frequency response. But H of S, and it's the Fourier transform of the output over the Fourier transform of the input. The frequency response we'll see is actually the Fourier transform of the output or the Fourier transform of, of the input. H of S is, we've been using this notation Y for our output and X for input, but circuit analysis, you know, these are voltages and currents typically. Might be a voltage to voltage ratio, might be current to current, might be voltage to current or current to voltage. But once we have the, the frequency response, that's the response to If we know the frequency response, we can find we can find the output due to a sinusoidal input, and we get the we get the output 
just by the amplitude is multiplied by the frequency response evaluated at the frequency of the sinusoid. Again, H of omega will generally be a complex function, okay, complex function of omega because, because of the J omega terms that are present. But the absolute value of H of omega is, is just a real number. So the amplitude is changed by running it through our circuit. The frequency is not changed, okay? If you run a, a pure sinusoid as an input to a, a linear circuit, the output is a pure sinusoid at the same frequency. Now there are nonlinear circuits, in which case if you feed it a sine wave at a particular frequency, you can get out other frequencies. But you know, the circuits we're looking at with resistors, inductors, capacitors are all linear circuits. An example of a nonlinear circuit is like a half wave rectifier or a full wave rectifier. You, know, you, feed it at, you feed it a sine wave, you get something out much different, right? Full wave rectifier, you got a sine wave coming in, which consists of just a pure tone. The output though, for a full wave rectifier, it's a periodic signal, but it's, it, and we could represent it in terms of a Fourier series. The fundamental frequency is actually twice that of the input, and then it's got all the harmonics. So this thing has a bunch of different frequencies. Again, that's, that's a nonlinear circuit. Any linear circuit, if you feed it a sine wave, you'll get out a sine wave of perhaps a different amplitude and then a, a phase shift or a time shift. Okay, and it should be the same frequency. Okay. No change, no change in the period. But there will be a phase shift. There could be a phase shift, which is the, the phase shift between the output and input is the angle of the frequency response evaluated at that, at the frequency of the input. Okay. Um, so we have for periodic X of T, Our, our X of T is, uh, I'm gonna write it slightly. This is the compact trigonometric form. One to infinity C X N cosine of N omega zero T plus V X N. Okay, this is the Fourier series in the compact trigonometric form for x of t. Now in the past, I just use c0 here and cn here. I'm putting little subscripts on them because we'll also have a Fourier series for the output of the circuit, this is the y function. But since x of t can be written as a sum of sinusoids, and we know the response of our circuit to each of these sinusoids, the Output is can also be written in terms of a Fourier series. C Y N cosine of N omega zero T plus C Y N. But I can calculate all of my C Y N terms and my V Y N terms from my Fourier series coefficients of my input and my frequency response. So CY zero, nothing more than CX zero times H of zero. H of zero will always be a real number okay, for our circuits. So you don't have to worry about the absolute value there. 
and the, the CYN or the CXN times the amplitude of the frequency response. Now notice the frequency of each of these terms. Okay, here was, here I, here I um, as input to the circuit, I used a sinusoid at a frequency of omega zero. I got out an output at the same frequency. Now I'm at, now I'm feeding the circuit a bunch of different sinusoids at different frequencies, at omega zero, at two omega zero, three omega zero. So I have to evaluate the frequency response at that frequency. So each of the CXNs corresponds to a different frequency. And then the phase angles are the phase angles of the input plus So this is the relationship between the input and output when you're working with Fourier series. And it's, it's pretty messy. And the, the biggest problem with the Fourier series is you, know, you can calculate these coefficients, but you really can't get a good, it's really difficult to visualize what, what the waveform looks like, right? You can start with a picture in the book, you know, some sawtooth waveform or a rectangular waveform and calculate the Fourier series coefficients, but it's really difficult to go the other way. Looking at the Fourier series coefficients, visualize what the waveform looks like. You, you have to resort to some sort of computer program to, to build this plot for you so that you can convert, so that you can see what that looks like. Now we've got tools that we can verify, you know, our circuits here, and go through the analysis here. You, we can use MATLAB to plot this. You could also just analyze the circuit in LT spice, you get a look at the output, compare your, your output there with the results from your Fourier series analysis to see that you've done that correctly. The other The other Fourier series that, well, we've worked with, with two others. We worked with the trigonometric Fourier series, the compact trigonometric Fourier series, and the exponential series. It's, it's, if we express the input in terms of a trigonometric Fourier series with the AN and BN, you can come up with an expression for the output in terms of a trigonometric uh, series, but the relationships between the ANs and BNs of the output and input are really complicated. And it's just too messy. So either use the compact trigonometric form or use the exponential form. Since the response to, I call it capital X here, capital X, e to the j omega zero t. Now h of, h of omega zero in general will be a complex number, but you know, so it would have a, a magnitude and phase. And you, you could write this as, e to the j omega zero t plus the angle of h omega zero t. If you wrote, if you express h of uh, omega zero in exponential form. So if we express x of t, J n omega zero t. This is the this is the form the exponential form of the Fourier series. Then y of t can be expressed like this, 
where, again, this is nothing more than a bunch of terms like that. So y of n would be h of n omega zero times x of n. And so it's usually simpler to work with the exponential form of the Fourier series. And, and if, if you want to go to one of the other forms, you, you can you can get those other coefficients from your xn coefficients or your or your yn coefficients. I'll work through an example in just a second. Um, but I want to cover one other point. It's called Parsifal's theorem. It allows us to calculate the power in a periodic waveform from the Fourier series coefficients. Remember the, the power in a sinusoid depends only on the amplitude. The power in the sinusoid like this, it's the RMS value squared. So the RMS value would be the amplitude divided by square root two so the power would be the amplitude squared divided by two. Now what power Parseval's theorem is most useful for is as we, as we start talking about filtering and we run a, a signal through a filter, what a filter will do is eliminate some of these terms or heavily attenuate them, pass through others. It'll pass through some frequencies but filter out other frequencies. So Parseval's theorem will allow us to determine the power that's passed through the filter. Um, so we had way back in chapter one, expression for the power in a waveform. This is the average power. Okay. <laughs> the power we've defined the power to be, if we if you think about voltage or current, and the power um, this dissipated in a resistor is V squared over R. The current is I squared R. So we kind of generalize that to talk about the power in a waveform as just the waveform squared. You can think of it as being the power that would be dissipated in a one ohm resistor if you want. Or just think of it as we define the power in a voltage or current just to be the voltage squared or the current squared. Now, this is actually for a periodic waveform, this is the average power, right? This is the power. We integrate that over a period and divide by a period then we get the average power. It's nothing, nothing more than an average calculation. If we integrate the power over a time interval, we get the energy. But once we divide by time, that gives us the energy per time is actually back to power. So this is the average power in the waveform. And this would be just a number okay, for any waveform. Parseval's theorem, States that we can express this power either in terms of the trigonometric Fourier series coefficients and that's nothing more than the amplitude squared divided by two of the cosine term and the sine term or In the compact trigonometric form, it's just the amplitude squared of each of those cosine terms 
divided by two. Uh, the phase doesn't affect the power. So it's the RMS amplitude of each of those squared, or even more simply, in the exponential Fourier series, it's just the sums of the x of n squared. So we do an example really quickly and then just to, I think it's similar to one of the homework problems that I've assigned for today. Okay. So and then I'll let you go. We'll get out of here a little early today. And, uh, this is problem 5.24, R1, R2. Out of T, I S of T. And here in the problem, we're given values for all these components. R1 is 500 ohms, R2 is 2 kilo ohms, and the capacitor is a third of a microfarad, 0.33 microfarads. And then we're, we're told that the input waveform is a periodic waveform. So it's, it's infinite in duration. And it looks like this. Five milliseconds, 20, milli, 20 milliamps. So this is the source current. So we're feeding this thing a current. And we're we're asked to calculate the output voltage. This is not this is not an easy problem. You guys have come a long way since circuits one, and, and the simple circuits you worked with were just um, were just DC sources, essentially uh, batteries for voltage sources. And then you get to the point where you could calculate the output of a circuit due to a sinusoid. And then now with Fourier series, Fourier transforms, and right now we've, we've extended our knowledge you know, one more step. We can calculate the output of our circuit to any periodic signal. And just in a few weeks, we'll be able to calculate the output to any input for which we can calculate the Fourier transform. So, the first step here is, is actually coming up with the Fourier series of this waveform. Again, that's not trivial. But the period here is five milliseconds. So the reciprocal of that one over five milliseconds is 200 hertz. So, but just knowing Fourier series, that tells us a lot about this waveform. It tells us that it had its First frequency component is at 200 hertz. The second frequency component is at 400. The third is at 600. They consist of only those frequencies. If you filtered out all but one, you get a pure sine wave. Now this waveform doesn't actually have even symmetry or odd symmetry. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a general case. Um, we are fortunate though that I believe this is one that's in that in the table that's in your book. So using that table, um, I guess it does have does it have odd symmetry if we shift it down. Like it does one over n sine of 
n times 400 pi t. So this is the Fourier series for the input. You have to find that in the table or do, do these calculations. This is in, this is actually in the, the trigonometric form, okay, but we'll, we'll handle that in just a second. Then the next step is, is calculating the transfer function. And that's not easy either. But one over SC for the impedance, plug in the resistance values. And you get the transfer function it can be written in this form. Where RT here is the sum of the two resistances. So it's R1 over R2 times RT times C times one over S plus one over RT times C. If you plug in the values, this becomes 606061 times one over S plus 1212 or to get the frequency response, and just substitute in J omega for S. Now what I what the NH of omega so h of omega again it's this complex function i could i could plot the magnitude and phase i really need to just evaluate it though at multiples of 400 pi well at 0 400 pi 800 pi 1200 pi and i can come up with the formula for that and omega zero just plugging in n times 400 pi and for omega, you get 606061, one over 1212 12 plus jn 400 pi. So at this point now I can calculate those numbers, those complex numbers, just for different values of n. And n equals zero is relatively easy. It's going to be the 606061 divided by 1212. 12. You know, with n equal to one, you know, it gives me the next complex number. You know, on your calculator, or use MATLAB to uh, find a bunch of them. Um, so what I need though are you know, the magnitude and phase angles of these. And easy to get in on your calculator. It would be 606061, and then the square root of the sum of the squares. And the phase angle would be phase angle of the numerator, which is it's a real number, so that's zero, minus the phase angle of the denominator. So that would be the imaginary part over the real part. The imaginary part does not include the J. Okay, so it's just N 400 pi. So, and now I've got two real functions, no J's left at this point. All right, so I can evaluate these for different, different values of N. And, and they're just numbers at this point. Now, I want to go back to IS of T because normally we use as our reference waveform the cosine. So I need to express the sine in terms of the cosine. But I can do that as 10 milliamps. So, <clears throat> 
Um, a cosine shifted 90 degrees to the right is a sine. So that would be subtracting 90 degrees. I'm going to get rid of the minus sign by just adding 180. Okay, so I'll end up adding 90 degrees to my cosine. 20 milliamps over pi, some n equal one to infinity, one over n cosine of n 400 pi t, and then I'll end up with plus 90 degrees. So it's just an alternate expression for is and t. But now I'm done. The output voltage, or at least I can come up with an expression. I'm going to write it like this just because incorporating those numbers into this expression just makes it even more unwieldy. Cosine of N 400 I T plus these corresponding phase angles. Whereas C zero Y actually turns out to be five. It's the 10 milliamps times, I evaluate this at N equal to zero. And that turns out to be five. The CNY in general turn out to be 12.12 over pi times one uh, over N. 12, 12 squared plus n squared, 400 squared pi squared. The n was from the one over n here that's in my expression. That's where that one over n comes from. And then I've got the 12, 12 squared plus n squared, 400 squared pi squared. The 606061 uh, divided by uh, or multiplied by the 20 milliamps, that gives me the 12.12 .12 here. And then the last thing is the phase angle here would be the 90 degrees minus the arc tangent of the N 400 I over 12, 12. Okay, that would be the solution for the Fourier series of the output. Have no idea what that looks like. And this is the input. Really have no idea from looking at this equation what, what that looks like. You'd have to go to you know computer program then to, to plot this to see what this sum looks what the sum looks like. You know, plotting out over 40 terms or 60 terms or something like that. All right, have a good weekend. Ready for your 354 exams. Not exams, exams.